Okay, so now move on to from a UK perspective to an international perspective, and we are very lucky today to be hearing from the African Research Integrity Network. Uh, Krista Libanadze and Francis will be speaking about the work of their organisation and the great strides that it's made. I'm delighted that they'll be here today. Francis is running slightly late uh, because of the time difference, uh, but will be joining us shortly. Thank you very much, um, James and everybody. Um, I'm just waiting for the magic to happen for the presentation to appear on the screen. I'm just about uh, to bring up your slides now. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, I think just to say uh, on behalf of the Research Integrity Network and um, all of us in Africa, to the colleagues from the UK RIO, we've been borrowing a lot from the work that's freely available on your website. And it's so nice to be able to engage virtually, but really uh, build on work done by each other. Um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. And we're starting with acknowledgements. As I said, thank you for the invitation and the support that we're getting for this presentation. Um, I also want to acknowledge the organizers of the World Conference on Research Integrity, who helped us with some of the slides appearing here, and my fellow Research um, Integrity Network Steering Committee members, Francis Conway from Kenya, Limbanazo Matandika from Malawi, and then myself. Um, thank you. We can go to the next slide, uh, which will just show you the three main sections of this presentation. Um, and because English is a foreign language for many of us from outside the UK, uh, I'm good at prepositions, research integrity and Africa, research integrity in and for Africa, uh, we, we will speak a little bit more about our network and then research integrity in, for and from Africa. We will, we will introduce you to the work of the World Conference on Research Integrity, which will take place next year in Africa, but digitally this year. Thanks. We can go on to the next slide where you will see a beautiful picture about Africa, which is a, uh, it's, a it's not a country, it's a continent with uh, 54 countries uh, recognized by the UN, uh, 55 by the African Union. And most of these borders were actually drawn during uh, the time of colonization. Um, and that's why there are also many indigenous languages, but there are also many common languages, uh, many Francophone countries, many um, Anglophone countries and also Lucifone countries, um, which brings a few barriers, but also brings opportunities for collaboration, um, reaching diversity, but also commonalities. Um, we have a richness of knowledge systems, uh, second largest continent in terms of land area second most populous at the moment, expected to become the most populous not long from now. Um, we're currently approaching 20% of the world population, but only 2% of the global research production, which is one of the challenges. So the next slide is in about Africa and research. Um, the research and research capacity, the, the Levels of funding for research are limited, given the fact that we've got a very large young population. There's not so much for tertiary education. A lot of money has to go to primary education. Um, in the post-colonial area, which is now about 60 years already, uh, universities, more universities were established. A lot of growth in enrollment at universities 
and still happening, but unfortunately accompanied by uneven qualities of re teaching research and very, very few, uh, relatively speaking, research intensive universities. Um, there are also, apart from universities, other non-research, non-university non research centers where the, a lot of good research is being done, very often in the field of biomedical sciences. And then in terms of mobility, uh, there's quite a lot of lecturer and student mobility between countries and also from south to north, if I can say that. But um, not so much in terms of if you look at the research outputs. We, we see that there's more collaboration with, between African researchers and researchers from outside Africa when it comes to funding and research. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. So those are just in sort of observations. Then when we sort of drill down to research misconduct, um, because there aren't similar systems of reporting and so on, there's very really little information on research misconduct. So I can refer to a little study that uh, I was involved in with two friends, uh, Teresa Rousseau and and Diapang Peng Matsao, where we did an exploratory study of um, retracted articles involving um, authors or co-authors from African institutions. Um, importantly to remember, retraction is not the same as misconduct, sometimes to retract is an example of good research practice. And what we did find is that the levels of retraction involving researchers from Africa are sort of at similar levels with other countries and reasons, regions. And that the reasons for retractions are also quite similar to what happens in other and more developed uh, countries. Most prevalent reasons that we found in our little study of um, covered only five years were uh, called plagiarism and duplicated publications. And we uh, thought if we analyze the reasons for retraction and um, also the losses, you know, that go the, the financial losses if one ends up retracting, to retracting and also the other losses, uh, we must think better about training, awareness raising, and communication, and power relations that I've already heard about, we've heard people speaking about. So in that little study, at the end of the presentation, you'll see references, but that little study just showed us uh, research integrity and its other not so nice side, research misconduct, not so different in Africa as uh, in comparison with other parts of the world. The next slide then speaks to um, the system structures and support, which we, uh, I've already alluded to the fact that we have a few national systems in place, actually not really national systems in place. Um, and also, unfortunately, few structures or support systems um, explicitly established at institutional level more instances of research ethics compliance than we have for research integrity. But there are pockets of initiatives emerging, and I can just say nationally in Uganda, more recently also in South Africa with the National Research Foundation also uh, publishing a statement on unethical research practices. Um, there are training and degree programs involving research ethics, but also integrity. Um, in Nigeria, we've got lovely examples of the uh, Young Academy of Science uh, offering training on plagiarism and avoiding that. Um, Ghana and Kenya examples of projects funded mostly by UK, US funders, but growing uh, awareness of research integrity and then a lot of individual champions. So we can move to the next slide to say, well, the fact that we've only got few individual champions, not a lot of knowledge. Um, we, we, we also in our um, work realized that in our continent, research is more mature. Um, oftentimes people see research integrity, research responsible conduct of research related or similar to ethics, 
always important. Um, and sometimes also because we've got to make do with limited resources, pressure on ethics committee structures and officials to take on the additional responsibility of research integrity promotion. And we know that um, if you are responsible for research integrity issues, you sometimes have to deal with very complicated labor relations issues, power relations issues, whereas with research ethics, it has to do with human um, rights issues and, and compliance and good research practice. So related, but it is important that we understand that there are also differences. And in our engagement with others, we also saw that there's a need to broaden knowledge and skills in the field. Um, if we offer training in, in terms of research integrity, we must look at early career scientists, but also mid-career managers. Everybody needs to know something, different aspects of research integrity to support each other and that the big pictures of the jigsaw puzzle can fit in better together. And we said there's a big need for inter-institutional collaboration so that the lonely integrity officer at this institution can engage with a lonely one at the other institution and that we can learn from each other and grow together. So the next slide then speaks about the whole issue of networking where I can speak about the African Research Integrity Network of which we are um, members of the steering committee. Um, it was conceived in 2015 at the fourth World Conference on Research Integrity, where there were very few delegates from Africa. And they didn't really actually know each other, but they came together. There was a magical person, I think it was Zoe Hammett, who said, come together in this post session and come together and talk to each other, um, because there's also a, a lack of data, as I mentioned. And, these people said, okay, we meet each other, but we will try to remain in touch. And from that, the seeds of building a network were sown. Still a very informal, voluntary and unfunded network. Uh, we bring in together people from different parts of the continent. Uh, we all share an interest in integrity. Not everybody has a role to play formally, but as long as people are passionate about integrity, they are very welcome. We learn from each other. Um, there are people who are very extremely knowledgeable and we can learn from each other. Um, as a network, we are growing by communicating, trying to coordinate and promote and activate. We have newsletters, we've got webinars. That is one of the benefits of the time of COVID is that we are engaging more um, free on platforms like Zoom. And we are working towards a constitution and a formal launch in 2022. Uh, the next slide just tells a little bit more about uh, Irene. Um, we currently only about 68 members, 11 African countries. You can see most members come from South Africa, the brown uh, country there. And we've got friends of Irene from the USA, UK, and Europe as well. And that group, we, we engage, we get responses. So uh, very uh, good to work together. The next slide just says who we are. Um, we have a slogan to say promote research integrity in Africa and for Africa. We've got a logo that was developed by one of our members. We had a competition and we actually voted for this beautiful logo. Uh, we've got a little subcommittee working on our goals and objectives and, and so on. And the current wording of the proposed goal um, to nurture a culture of integrity for African researchers, institutions and decision makers guided by African perspectives and focused on groups and inclusive thinking. And one of the comments we've received already said, guided by African and global perspectives. So we are sort of hopefully in the next month or so, our goal will be finalized. The next one just says our proposed objectives also um, under revision from inputs from our teams um, to sustain dialogue, engagement, to develop a better understanding and sensitize people about uh, research integrity, but also the conditions of research 
for research integrity in Africa, because there are some more challenges and opportunities. To share relevant information and resources so that if this institution develops a policy, that one can borrow. Uh, it's always nice to learn and work with each other and to nurture capacity building and leadership. So those are our proposed objectives. And um, then we are um, moving to the next slide because this is then moving to our um, proposed launch. We hope to, as I said, the birth of Arin at the fourth world conference, the next world conference um, will take place in 2022 in Cape Town. And I just wanted to remind you of the importance and the value of these world conferences. I know many of you have attended, uh, presented at such conferences. The Singapore statement that I personally love and you probably all know uh, was adopted in 2010 after the second world conference. The Montreal Statement on Research Integrity um, adopted in 2013. The Hong Kong Principles, when I uh, heard of the reference to the uh, practices of, of assessing researchers, uh, this is one that you must please check out. And if you've not reviewed it yet, please do review it. And, um, and if you agree with it, please endorse it. Because the more endorsements there are, the more people can sort of uh, negotiate and say, but the research community is behind this kind of uh, um, movement towards not counting number of publications, not counting um, impact factor, but looking at invisible important things like mentorship and, and peer review and all these things that we're doing as good citizens of the science community. Um, so those are the past conferences. The next one, seventh conference in Cape Town, South Africa. We were so excited when it was accepted to be hosted in Africa for the first time. And the conference theme being fostering research integrity in an unequal work and it world. And it links to your conference theme about in a changing world. So the next uh, one is just to say how our wonderful conference code. Oh, yeah, that's just the picture of our next conference uh, that will happen. Um, and then that there will be as our conference coaches when they had to postpone from 2021 to 2022, because of the COVID pandemic, they turned the challenge into an opportunity by saying let's bridge from Hong Kong to Cape Town. And um, let us uh, have a digital event where we will, uh, I think if we can go to the next slide, where there will be uh, people invited by the conference coach chairs to attend that event free of charge. Uh, it will be the 31st of May until the 2nd of June, so it's quite soon. You can register online. There will be 12 web webinars on six topics uh, with uh, speakers from across the globe. Uh, across the globe. The session topics are duplicated so that if you are in this time zone, you can attend it in the morning. But if you're in another time zone, you attend it in your morning, but in our evening. So that is the wonderful thing about that conference. If we go to the next slide, uh, the digital event. Um, EET stands for Eastern Europe time, I think. Um, and those will be the sessions, so it's morning, 10 o'clock, or evening sessions. What is research integrity? How might funders and publishers respond to new challenges towards a Cape Town statement on fostering research integrity through equity, fairness, and diversity? Looking back at the Hong Kong principles, what can research producing organizations do to foster research integrity and research interpretation and data use with integrity? So. Um, those are the sessions that you will be able to attend one or all or some if you if you register. So that is the next slide taking us just then to the 2022 conference where you will see uh, there are very interesting plenary sessions, focus track, doctoral forums, etc. You can check out the website where you can see where you can register, 
submit abstracts quite soon. And hopefully, if your abstract is accepted, even apply for a conference travel permit. Um, and then the next slide is just uh, to say the resources. You can check those out if you want to know more about the stuff I've been rushing through. And then the last slide is the one I love because it shows you in Africa, we say thank you from A to Z. Asante means thank you in Swahili, that's Francis's language. Donkey is my language, thank you, I can also say, um, in between from Nigeria and um, Zambia and South Africa, and Zikomo is what Limbanaza would say from Malawi. Thank you so ever, ever so much for the opportunity, and sorry I've uh, taken too much time, but if one is excited, you do that. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much. No, thank you for taking too much time at all. It's fascinating to learn about your, the work of your organisation, just how much you're achieving. You know, I mean, UK Rio, we cover a country. You guys cover an entire continent. And I think the achievements of your organisation, also the, the passion and the energy of the people behind it, are both to be admired. Thank you very, very much. I will stop the screen sharing and we have time for a few questions. Okay, right. Uh, <clears throat> Nicola asks, uh, you mentioned that levels of research funding are diminishing to a degree. Why is that the case? Um, because of the, well, the demands on other, uh, on other priorities. If I think about my own country, there is so much of demand for access to university education. Um, young people who cannot afford university education, who need bursaries, who, who need access to formal education. So if a university has limited funding, um, the funding goes to teaching rather than to research. Um, also international funding um, often uh, because a lot of funding has been, uh, research funding has been dependent on international funding, sometimes these resources are being diverted to other priorities, not necessarily coming to Africa because I think we must also look at funding from our own resources, not only from international resources. So probably I can say because of the rising demand for um, other uh, very important priorities as well. Thank you. Considering the conflicting priorities and we uh, institutions in the UK, for example, it's found that institutions can often say that they're too busy or too, uh, too much time pressure to re-engage with issues of research integrity. How well are research integrity initiatives that, from your organisation elsewhere be, being received? I think um, in, in, in our case, sort of research integrity is something that we must try to build a culture of awareness because um, I've seen long ago a very lovely picture by the Canadian integ um, group uh, that worked on their research, responsible conduct of research, and they spoke about promotion, prevention, I speak about, and then sanction. And if we don't promote, and if we don't put systems and structures in place to help prevent misconduct, then we end up ha having the problem of, of transgressions knowingly and sometimes unknowingly. And, and that becomes the messy, murky, horrible part we, we which we would like to avoid. And I, I think very often people try to hide away things that are wrong and, 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 not, and only wake up if there are really big problems. So we need to find a way of, of promoting awareness, seeing the urgency of, of operationalizing and um, recognizing research integrity as 
a key driver of research excellence um, and a key driver of saving money because if we do research with integrity there won't be real wastage of, 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 of research that was sort of had to be retracted or whatever so yeah. I don't know if I'm answering correctly but I think we do need and, and that's where we even see Irene and, and working together with, with structures that have the power to influence governments and the, the African Union to start mainstreaming uh, responsible conduct of research as part of, of what we do. And as much as you are debating, how can we make training on integrity or responsible conduct of research mandatory to say, how can we work towards developing materials that can be accessible by universities that are poor or rich but they can use maybe the online material to, to train uh, postgraduate researchers and say this is a module that will count towards or that can be seen as, as an, something you've got to do as part of the requirements for your degree study. So we are dreaming big, uh, but I think it's, it's about awareness raising. Yes, and also true. acknowledging the good things happen. Thanks. Sorry, I'm talking to you. No, 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 it's, it's fascinating. Uh, actually, some of what you said leads into another question. Uh, but none of the commenters said it's great your network's been established. Are there moves within different countries in Africa to establish national systems for research integrity, perhaps backed by government or research vendors, or initiatives mainly coming from your network and academic institutions? Um, at the moment, we're not aware of um, national uh, networks. Um, we, we do have in South Africa that I'm aware of uh, communities of practice where ethics and integrity um, issues are being discussed amongst each other. But we don't yet have um, funding, which I would be, uh, you know, you don't need a lot of money to have a little network going. Um, but to have a, if you have a website and you've got a little bit of money just to host workshops and so on, uh, a lot of, a little money can go a long way. So that is the next step because um, an, a continental network cannot achieve as much if it but it can achieve much more if it has chapters for Nigeria or for West Africa uh, or for East Africa. So we are thinking about that, but that is hopefully a next step as we are growing. And sometimes things are organic, uh, where initiatives can link up then to the uh, coordinating umbrella body. Thank you. Uh, one final question from Philippa, uh, noting that there's often a balance between upholding standards that are accepted or expected in one's own nation and then managing standards when working with partners in other countries where standards can be different and there also can be different expectations of research influenced by local cultures and the like. Uh, what are your views on how to manage those potential tensions? I think the biggest word uh, is uh, the two biggest words for me would be communication and respect. Um, oftentimes, we we don't explicitly state our expectations, um, and we don't listen to each other in a way that we understand realize we're actually saying the same thing in different ways. Um, um, also to um, yeah to learn from each other and with each other because I think it's it's not about uh, thinking that we have all the answers or that we have all the problems uh, all of us have answers and all of us have problems but the important thing is to see research as a shared endeavor where we all learn and are shaped together as a team. And I think now with things like 
uh, Zoom being so much more sophisticated and and webinars and so on, that people must just engage more uh, when they work together on research projects and um, and joint publications. Thank you so much. It's been a fascinating session. Great to learn more about uh, the work of you, your colleagues have been doing, and the challenges we've been facing, and the successes you're having. And I mean, we've already had one some great conversation between UK and ARN, and we're looking forward to having more and working with you more in the future. So thank you so much for you coming along today. Uh, it's been great to hear from you.